So if you take a look at the folder in front of you, you will see many facts that are enlightening about our current situation. Okay, here we are in the studio. It's June 17th. You're listening to KRUI in Iowa City. My name's Justin Comer. You're listening to I Hear, I See Radio. It's a show about local talent and all the stuff that we do here in town. And today I have a special guest in the studio with me. Would you like to introduce yourself? I mean, I have to, right? Can yeah, you okay. are required. I am Gabby Vanek. Hey, Gabby. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Regular listeners to the show heard Gabby before on episode 20, the Too Many Guests episode. <laughs> we had uh, about two or three more people than we had microphones in the studio that night. There's the same amount of people here now. You just can't hear them. Yep. Everyone else is a silent observer today. <laughs> uh, so, Gabby, what are we, uh, we going to do today? I don't know. I, I was thinking about this because I listened to the last time that I was on the show mm-hmm. and I spoke too fast and I said oh, okay. like as as <laughs> a filler for every other sent word. So Okay, so I don't we're know. working on our, our radio uh yeah. presence. Yeah, today. radio voice. Yeah. Just I don't know, we're gonna talk, I think we're gonna play. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I use a lot of filler and I've been doing this for like 30 weeks now so <laughs> so I, I don't think it's really anything to worry too much about yeah but i gotta gotta slow down yeah <laughs> uh so um yeah have you heard that intro music before that i played i don't think so did okay. you write it no actually jason palomar oh that, red yeah. hi jason yeah <laughs> we released that on the last uh thing that we did oh, together the last sweet. collaborative album yeah, it's called Let's All Go to a Boring Meeting, and I've been using it I've been using it as the intro for a couple weeks now. It's excellent. Yeah, I like its sort of psychogenesis metal sound. Yes. <laughs> uh so yeah, I guess let's let's talk about you a little bit. Oh, we can talk about me. Yeah, Current so what, affairs. Yeah, what do you do? What do I uh well, I guess I do bassoon stuff mostly. Mm-hmm. Um I finished my master's uh I guess already. It'll be two years ago, um in December. And then promptly had to get surgery and wasn't really playing and accidentally moved back to Iowa City. Yes. <laughs> and then since I've been back, I've just been mostly just practicing and selling kazoos and um, being an electrician like I was before. So. Oh, I, I don't think I knew about your electrician work. Oh, really? Yeah. So when I used to work for the university as, you know, like one of like the lighting technician master electricians for like the performing arts mm-hmm. unit. I always kind of kept my like hand in that. And when I was living in Kansas, I did some union work. Oh, cool. Um, but coming back here, like I knew the people at CCPA and right. I was able to, so, you know, a couple times a week I'll go in there and usually it's just like watching the space to make sure it doesn't like blow up. Right. But every so often I get to program, but I'm not supposed to hang lights and do heavy lifting things while I'm injured or crippled or right yeah whatever. i knew about, i knew about your uh, stage lighting work i didn't know it went deeper than that yeah i mean stage lighting it all kind of just like goes into the same sort of thing yeah. but no i'm not like a certified electrician gotcha, or anything, which gotcha. i probably should be it would be a, well you've done union work so that's that's you know that's I, real I, stuff right? i yahtzee i mean it was <laughs> i mean it's still like stagehand electrician union work but it was cool i got to see paul mccartney he yeah. is like this big <laughs> he was actually nice to the crew yeah I'm trying to think who who does Sweet Caroline? What's what's his face? Uh, is that uh, Neil Diamond? Oh, is it okay? Yeah, he was. I was kind gonna of, say uh, he was kind James of, Taylor. I was gonna oh, say. Well, I think you're right though. It's Neil Diamond. Well, <laughs> yeah. whatever. If it is him, he was kind of jerk. He came backstage um, at one of the arena shows in Kansas and like kind of covered his face while he was walking by the crew. So I mean, yeah, it is Neil Diamond by the yeah. way. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just confirm. Her- I right. believed you, but I just wanted to make sure. I mean, it's possible that I was uh, wrong. So, yeah. uh, And for the listeners, um, when Gabby said that Paul McCartney is this big, she held her hands about six inches apart. Yeah. So Paul McCartney is a small man. He's a beetle, a like, literal beetle. <laughs> oh, like a, like a bug. Okay, <laughs> <Yeah>. gotcha. Uh, <laughs> no, that was like, I think the last big union show I worked before I, I left was, mm-hmm. I guess he did like a United States tour. So he actually hit Wichita, Oklahoma City and Kansas City. So the Wichita show was sold out, which doesn't happen very frequently so yeah. it was cool to push his piano oh yeah yeah how big is wichita it's a metro of five hundred thousand people okay but you would never know because it's so spread out like 
it, it's kind of weird. I never had a sense of how big of a place it was. Mm-hmm. There's like a military base there, and then like uh, what, what, Airbus or some like there's a bunch of like airline manufacturing, and then like there's the university, and then like Coke Industries, and right, yeah, all that's that. right. They're based in Kansas. Yeah. yeah, I walked out of the Charles Coke Arena when I got my <laughs> my master's. So that's awesome. Yeah, it was kind Is of. Is his weird. name on your diploma or anything? <laughs> No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Though now I have to check. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got to play a uh, uh, PSA real quick. Yeah. Let's see what we get on the, the random PSA rotation. The Iowa Youth Writing Project is a nonprofit, volunteer powered outreach organization that seeks to empower, inspire, and educate Iowa's children and teens through language arts and creative writing. The IYWP provides free after school and in school support to teachers and students in Eastern Iowa. Support our mission. Visit IYWP.org and click donate or click volunteer to get involved. There you go. Okay, we're back. Uh, okay, so do you, do we want to like intro your, your playing style before you jump in or should yeah. we just... Or we yeah. can just jump right into it. I mean, well, let me, I have to soak a read. So. Oh, okay. So we should talk for we a little bit. We can talk for a little bit. Okay, so uh, who, who taught you bassoon? Um, I guess like the official answer mm-hmm. is when I got, to, I didn't really take lessons when I, when I was in high school, I had one teacher and he was just kind of like a crotchety old man mm-hmm. sort of character, but he, you know, it was like, he taught me enough, but I was mostly self, like he, I didn't, wasn't taking lessons when I auditioned for school. So I was in Ben Quelio's studio yep. um, and I had to audition to get in and I didn't make it immediately. Um, but he's like, if you take lessons and do good maybe you'll get it. So then I did. Um, so I, I studied with him a lot and I still do when he's available. And then I went to Wichita and worked with Stephanie Patterson, who was a doctoral student here when I was here. So it was yeah, yeah. like that. And, you know, so I, I don't want to say I'm self-taught cause that's not fair, but <laughs> I guess like my introductory bassooning was very self-taught until I got to, uh, to right. college and yeah. beyond. Did you grow up here? No. Okay. I grew up in South Florida which is awful, like this, actually. Yeah, it's hot. But, it's hot out today, by the yeah. way. If you are, if you're waiting on our weather report, I'll give you a preview. It's <laughs> very hot. <laughs> and it's humid. Okay, so so you you were teaching yourself bassoon in Florida? No, so yeah, so I moved. I, yeah, I moved around a lot as a okay. kid. I grew up. I like lived in Florida until I was like twelve years old. Okay, okay. and then I lived in like Southern New York um, for high school, and then I moved here like immediate like for college. But my mom and my parents had wound up moving so i was like oh well i guess i'm just gonna live here now okay so yeah so i'm not really from anywhere in particular but i realized i've lived in iowa longer than i lived in new york but i've still lived in florida the longest i haven't lived there in 14 years so like there's some yeah (laughs) weird stuff going on yeah i realized that i've lived in iowa city now for six years i think wow which is like catching up to how long i lived in cedar rapids it's weird, Which right? felt like forever. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's weird. Because, I mean, I split my time between here and Kansas when I had moved. So it was like I never really quite left. And I, I was like, I'm not registering my car in Kansas. I, I refuse. <laughs> not for any other reason than my insurance would have gone up. So Really? Yeah. Kansas car insurance is higher than here? Yeah, because the Wichita metro area was is larger. Right. It's more people to crash into. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> but, yeah, so I was self-taught up until college essentially and then I was just always trying to work hard and get good because you know when I like my high school was like really small I was the only bassoonist Mm -hmm. and so like you have no concept of if you're good or not oh yeah definitely (laughs) so you're just like oh hey I'm playing this yeah (laughs) and then I was like oh no I am not like you know when I got here but it was I don't know when I, I remember when I was picking schools what I liked about Iowa at least at the, the school of music at the time was that there was like this immediate sense of community and camaraderie of people just wanting to work together. I mean, I'm sure we were competitive in our own, own ways, but I think like my goals were probably different than other people in the studio. I was just like, I need to get good and practice a lot and mm-hmm. kind of see where I get. But I was, I never, I didn't grow up in classical music. So it was, I was like, Oh, I have to play Vivaldi. Great. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. I felt, uh, so I, I studied composition here, yeah. as you know, but the listeners may or may not. Uh, so I got my master's here. And when I was studying here, I also didn't really feel competitive, yeah. I guess. Uh, it felt more like a 
friendly community of composers. I don't know if it's that way everywhere or not. Yeah. I have a limited experience. I don't know. I mean, I can't say for Wichita because they had all sorts of weird things going on that like I I will not disparage them, (laughs) but it it was more just like, it was hard because you had people, the the way the master's program worked at Wichita is that some studios, the TA ship was actually getting to play in the Wichita Symphony, which is pretty cool. So like I went to school with someone who had gone to like Curtis and like NEC. So you had people who were like, really great players and then you just had like you know people who could barely play their instrument (laughs) and so like i think it's kind of cool like if you don't know what you want and you're just content to practice and learn i think wichita is a great environment but if you're at a certain level you're going to get very frustrated very quickly and i saw that happening with a lot of the grad students for me i was just like oh god i'm in grad school had this happen (laughs) yeah uh what what were the frustrations Uh, exactly (laughs) i think playing quality would be like a a big one for a lot of people. Um, There's only one orchestra. So, I mean, I guess it's like that here, but it was even smaller. So Mm -hmm. you would have like non-major string players, you know, but it's like, it's rough when you have all the wind players or grad students. And then all of a sudden, like your section violins who aren't the principals are just like, don't know what's going on. Just people that live in the area. Area. Yeah. Yeah. Or or just non-major students. But some of the violinists were like amazing. So it was always interesting, but I learned a lot. I don't regret my time there. Um, at all. I met some really wonderful people. And I think like that was when like my brain finally clicked that, oh, I should play bassoon all the time. Like, cause my first year there, I just wasn't comfortable. I was like, I shouldn't be here. And then like, I was like, oh no, I'm, you know what? I'm going to just work really hard, see how I do. And then by the summer, well, unfortunately in February of my third year of grad school or second year, third semester, second year is when this injury stuff started to happen so it was like as soon as i had figured out what i had wanted to do it was like ha sucks to suck yeah not gonna be easy (laughs) not gonna be easy and so but somehow i managed to make it into two summer festivals that year only could afford to go to one because they're expensive yeah yeah money (laughs) um yeah and so i came back i still had to give a recital but i was hoping that i would be able to kind of just you know not play in any ensembles just practice because i'd I hadn't had to, I hadn't been told I needed surgery yet. They're like, maybe if you just don't play a lot. And then of course that did not happen. Like they were like, well, if you want to keep your assistantship, you need to play in every ensemble. And I was like, okay. So I gave like a really crappy recital, fortunately finished it, but I'm like not proud of it certainly. But, and then I got surgery as soon as I graduated mm-hmm. essentially. And so it's just been like kind of trying to catch myself back up to, where I want to be Mm -hmm. instead of like just being able to take auditions and or just play as much as I want to yeah so what is what is the injury situation do you want to be specific I mean I can because I think it's like I don't know like I think instrument injury is like something that people don't really talk about the way they probably should and the the conflict between your health and your ability to keep your assistantship sounds like a very was, real thing to discuss. Yeah, and it was really bad. And and like I said, I, I, like I, said, I don't want to disparage because I think part of the problem was is that they were really short people. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you're short and your assistantship is tied into that, but I was like, I had already paid for most of my degree out of pocket. I wasn't about to just drop out and not do it. And, and it, But it was one of those things where it's like, I'm... I would venture that I had to get surgery because I wasn't able to quietly play, like able to just play for an hour. Instead, it was like, oh, six hours a day, yeah. your thumb's popping out of place kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but what happened was I was diagnosed with something called Dequervain's tenosivitis, and it's the uh, tendon that runs up your thumb, um, essentially. And because bassoon is just the most ergonomically... yes. <laughs> Very perfect. Instrument. Very well designed for modern hands. And, yeah. Or and, and so like I remember I woke up one day and it was like February, and my th- like I stretched my hand and then my thumb just like wouldn't go back into place. I was like, oh, that's that's fun. So I was able to click it back in, but then anytime I moved my thumb, it would pop out of place again. And so I was just constantly feeling this click when I played, and I couldn't play quick, and it just wouldn't stop. It was a fun... Jeez. Yeah. And this is just on your left hand? It was just on my left hand. I later found out because I started having issues where I wasn't feeling the tips of my fingers and I was like in chronic pain around like my chest and my neck. It wasn't until after I had surgery when I was like, hey, how come I still can't feel my fingers and why am I in chronic pain that 
is like doesn't have anything to do with this. Right. And what they told me is that it's something called, um, oh shoot, what's it called? Oh, uh, bilateral thoracic outlet syndrome, which sounds super fancy. Apparently it happens to baseball players a lot, but one of the big things is that it's for people who are like this all the time and for uh-huh. people who are like this all the time yeah. and like doing electric for, for the listeners uh gabby yeah, sort yeah. of put her hands like she was holding a bassoon and then up above her head <laughs> yeah like and doing like electrical heavy gotcha. lifting yeah. things yeah. and so i was like oh that's like the only thing i've ever done ever um and so essentially like and having bad posture which is one of those things that it's when someone tells you you have bad posture you're just like yeah whatever yeah that's um, me <laughs> yeah and so it never really occurred to me and then all of a sudden I was like, oh my goodness, like my posture is so bad that get, I think at one point, if there's like a couple of videos and pictures of me from last year, like my shoulder was like over here. And like, because I'd gotten like, so like used to like trying to like compensate for like where things hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so it's like, oh, you have a nerve injury and you need to like relearn how to sit, hold yourself essentially and hold your instrument and so that's kind of where I'm at now is like, it's not a hundred percent better. I don't know if it ever will be, but I'm definitely like where I was last summer. I could, I couldn't even play faster than like 30 clicks. Mm-hmm. And now I'm at like, I got to 112 today. Like that's yeah. s- small steps for me, you know. Yeah, 30 to 112 is a pretty big jump. <laughs> yeah, you know, so. <laughs> and we're like, this is like two years out from your diagnosis, mm-hmm. something like that? Okay. Yeah, well, the nerve diagnosis wasn't until last last year. The, okay. the initial the first just first the one thing. was the yeah. f- thumb thing was back in 2016 so mm-hmm. it, it's been like a fun well no it ha- it's <laughs> it's been an interesting two-year period but i think like there's like a level of it where when you can't practice like it, it was like well what else do i like to do and i mean i like doing video stuff and but as far as like what i would rather be doing is like all i want to do is practice and talk about weird music and yeah you know yeah. being a death metal band so well i'm fun. glad to give you an outlet to talk about yeah music thanks today, justin at least. yeah especially <laughs> since i've moved back it's been fun to hang out with everybody and yeah yeah do weird stuff but yeah. i can play whenever you're, you're ready or yeah is your read ready I mean, to go eh, i'm sure it's fine okay yeah <laughs> okay so uh yeah you want to get set up and i'll yeah. i'll just sort of babble for a minute okay all right so uh we're getting close to 3 30 so why don't i give you the weather report a couple minutes early current temperature is 93 degrees fahrenheit feels like 101 yeah <laughs> precipitation's at 15 percent. humidity is at 50 percent. it's partly cloudy and we've got 15 mile per hour winds from the south southwest <laughs> and i'm gonna turn on these mics now and we'll start hearing gabby play through an amp in a minute uh, if you uh, if you have something to say, you can reach oh. us uh, on Twitter during the show. If you're listening live, we're at I Hear I See. If you have anything to say about Gabby's performance, if it's a good thing to say, I will pass it on to her. No, <laughs> at, tell me if it's bad too. Okay, I'll give her. Uh, be constructive at least. Yeah. How's I that? Drive on negative. <laughs> okay. okay.
All right, that was a live in-studio performance by Gabby Vanek on the bassoon with uh, some extra stuff that I will I will let her fill in the blanks there. <laughs> She's got some equipment set up. Obviously, that wasn't just straight bassoon, if you were listening. <laughs> so, Gabby, would you mind telling the, the listeners what, uh, what you've got on the floor there? Yeah, so I um, actually had a buddy who made a joke that She's like, oh, you have a Mooger Fugger. So you're like every other electronic musician who goes through that phase. So <laughs> Stockhausen can do it. I can do it. Yeah. Um, and then I have, um, well, it's the ring modulator, Mooger Fugger. I have this old uh, Electro Harmonics Memory Man that I kind of acquired and it's just kind of been there. But honestly, I'll probably wind up switching it out for an actual delay pedal and an actual looper because it does both of those things, but not as well mm-hmm. as I'd like them to. Um, and then I have this uh, Pitch Bay uh, harmonizing pedal, which is awesome uh, by Earthquaker Devices because it actually allows you to um, harmonize to dissonant um, intervals, instead right. of, which is too bad that other pedals don't because that's like all I've ever wanted. And then I have this um, Evil Fuzz Overdrive pedal by Dunifex. He's, uh, I think, out in St. Louis, um, just like boutique pedals, but a lot of like overdrive things like that but um it's a really evil sounding pedal on bassoon on bass it's actually just kind of fuzzy and comfy yeah. but <laughs> on bassoon it's a little bit much so mm-hmm. and you play bass too right i do i'm actually like secretly a, probably a better bass player than bassoon player um like my one claim to fame was in high school i won an award from berkeley college of music for playing bass and it was like oh well you know <laughs> i guess it's not as interesting to I don't know. Bassoon is definitely like a suffering instrument kind of thing. Right. So you've got a little bit of a masochistic thing. Yeah, but only with bassoon, you know, mm-hmm. like it's only bassoon. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned earlier that you did not grow up with classical music. No, no one in my immediate family is even a musician, to be honest. I mean, my um, stepdad is a percussionist, but like, like when I was younger, I mean, my mom doesn't play music. My dad certainly did. And, um, so it was like music was around and it was available, but I didn't like take piano lessons or anything like that. It was just something that was I was really interested in and mm-hmm. wanted to go from there. Yeah. So what were you listening to? I was listening to a lot of death metal all the time. There you go. That was, <laughs> <laughs> and I think when I got to, you know, to college and was like learning about, or even in high school, I was like, oh man, new music, like electroacoustic stuff is so cool. This is like the exact same tonal language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a similar experimental kind of philosophy. Yeah. I I love it. And I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I don't mind like, you know, standard rap stuff because I think it's important, but as far as for what I like to play and what was familiar to me growing up Mm -hmm. was more like, oh yeah, going to metal shows and, you know, seeing bands play. I mean, I, I, I mean, that's the, I have an article coming out and, um, September, just about like the crossover between, you know, um, death metal and classical music. Oh, cool. So That's being published somewhere? It's being published in Metal Music Studies. Nice. You can find it on JSTOR and Plagiarize Me. <laughs> so um, it, it's not coming out until September, but um, yeah, I had gone to a conference and uh, I guess back in 2016, um, right before I really gave, right before I gave my crappy master's recital, actually, mm-hmm. I had <laughs> flown to Denmark for this conference to talk at it. And then I flew back and then was like jet lagged and gave a shitty recital. So, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> That's all right. You said uh, it uh, mumbly enough. I okay. Think. <laughs> um, oh, but yeah. So I like hit it off with some of the people there and met like a bunch of other like people who are interested in like academic study in metal, which I had no idea was even a thing. Um, and so. Yeah, I admit I have never read that journal. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> um it's, there's some really interesting stuff, but I was one of the only people there who was more interested in a theoretical um, outlook rather than like a sociopolitical, because a lot of people mm, are really right. into like the sociology of the community, which I, I understand, but I don't really care. Um, <laughs> in, in so far as that, I think like, you know, we're always talking about, especially in classical music, like, oh, how do we get more people to listen and show up and come to things? But then you have like this genre that has a very similar tonal language that m- while it will never have maybe the fan base of, you know, popul- more popular music, there's a ton of people showing up to these shows and showing up to these concerts. Yeah. You know, and it's like... That's a so, good point. So what is the difference here? Like, what are we, what are we missing? Mm-hmm. And so, and I think that 
I don't necessarily think that death metal goes out of its way to be accessible because I think it's not. Often the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, in like writing about Gorguts and like uh, Luc Lemay, their um, main guitarist and like songwriter, I mean, he went to the Montreal Conservatory and he's like, oh, yeah, I love Penderecki. And that's like who he like channels. And, and yeah. he really likes Shostakovich. And I remember on their last album, I had emailed him um, and I was like, hey, this sounds like string quartet number seven. Were you doing that? He's like, yes. <laughs> you know, but it's, you know, I mean, I can go to a Gorgut show and there'll be at least, you know, like 100 people there, which, you know, I think by any show standards is still pretty good. And then you do a new music show and it's like five people. It's all students that, you know, yeah. <laughs> what do you think is the difference? I don't know. I don't know if there's just like this weird ivory tower thing with academic music, which is silly, but yeah, I haven't come up with a good answer. I don't know if because maybe like the compositional language that you use in more extreme music, like that's where it came from. The fans are there because they like the extreme and maybe academic music is still kind of entrenched in this, you know, standard rep land. And so you're considered weird if you're going outside of it. I, but I honestly, I couldn't tell you. I mean, mm -hmm. I have no idea because there's new music festivals all over the country, but it seems like I like it, the world is small enough where you know the same people at the same. Yeah, festivals. I think most of the people that are into new music are new musicians. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. I yeah. don't. But I, I don't know. I think it's definitely worth talking about because you want to talk about funding, you know, you know, contemporary music or even not or even just the orchestra in general um and then you have like these genres that don't i mean they don't make a lot of money touring sure but like they have fans and people who are willing to stand up and be like hey this is yeah something worth talking about and worth going to so yeah i don't know i, I could probably sound fancier about it but that's fine uh, <laughs> speaking of funding i have to play a grant spot real quick Ooh. <laughs> support for care ui is provided in part by the mill the Mill has been an Iowa City institution since 1962, offering dining and delivery, and is a music venue that highlights local talent and hosts touring performers from all around the world. Upcoming shows are on their music calendar at icmill.com. The Mill also hosts special events. The Mill is located on 120 East Burlington Street in Iowa City. Reservations can be made by phone at 319-351-9529 or by emailing reservations at icmill.com. And we're back. If you're just tuning in this is i hear i see radio i'm justin this is gabby hello <laughs> i did not know that you could call the mill for reservations yeah i i guess i didn't either <laughs> yeah it never and i've probably me. listened to that like 12 times yeah. at least all right <laughs> um uh, yeah so the mill delicious you should eat there <laughs> yeah um, we don't have to really do ads for them but uh but yeah, the mill's great <laughs> yeah and they have good music there so yeah frequently yeah usually like every night almost oh and tonight's pub quiz also worth going yeah you can go to that yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's not musical necessarily right. but uh there might you can be enjoy yourself music themes mm -hmm. um, but yeah i don't know we were talking about like crossover and classical music and non-classical genres mm -hmm. i yeah i wish i had like a deep answer with you know big words but i i honestly don't know what the answer is yeah there's a lot to it uh i mean the basic question is why is more extreme metal why does that draw more of a crowd than a more academic experimental music that's doing exactly. roughly the same sound <laughs> yeah and the only thing i can think is the crowd which is i guess why people want to do like the socio economic f thing right but at the same time it doesn't still doesn't make sense to me because I mean, you would think that, oh, academic, like if, if, if you have like this academic genre, there should be people who are willing to pay to go to these things. But instead they're like, oh, no, do it for the exposure. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> exposure is a, a uh, hot button issue for me. Oh. How do you feel about uh, playing gigs for free? <sighs> I will play a gig for free if if it's something that like I'm interested in, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. But if someone's just like, Oh, Hey, yeah, you should just play. I feel like, so this is my job. What do you, what, what is your job? Yeah. You know? Yeah. We could talk about that all day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but I specifically, uh, Jason and I, we've got, we've got a thing. We haven't been playing live that much recently since he moved to <laughs> Indiana and we, we don't really have the gas money to do that that often. But, uh, but, last year we kind of like made rules for ourselves and it's like 
we will do a gig for free if the person hosting the gig is like a friend of ours and we feel like we're on the same mission yeah together. absolutely no that yeah that's like a pretty that's like a, a, a good rule yeah 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 uh because i was asked to play something for free and like provide all of the audio equipment myself no <laughs> yeah yeah i i i don't know i probably would have done it but the guy uh he said the word exposure to me so i got mad and then yeah. And then that's why we pay people for I Hear I See yeah. Now is because I got mad. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. The fact that you've guys that you've been able to like make it to this like huge thing. Like I remember when it was at the warehouse. Yeah. And, yeah, that was before yeah. my time. Yeah, we're we're trying to keep it going it's awesome. as like a real thing where people can at least make a little bit off of it, you know? Yeah, no, it's awesome. Yeah. Like I don't mind. It's and I have fun doing it. Like I would like to do it more because I I definitely don't gig as much as I would like to. Mm-hmm. But even like bassoon gigs, like I, I like I think the best gig I ever had when I was in Kansas was I got to be like literally a court musician. The like the huge Lutheran church had a new organ. So mm. they like paid a couple of us to, like t- way too much for what it was, but I'm not gonna complain about it. <laughs> um while some like guy from Germany that they flew in yelled at us from the top of the organ. It was like all I've ever wanted as a bassoonist. <laughs> I was like, ah yes, of course. Yeah. So you're playing like a like a court musician were you dressed up like a jester or anything? no i was just wearing dress blacks um <laughs> yeah but it was very much so like there was the patron doctor who <laughs> was paying for all of this and they flew in the fancy organist from germany to yell at us and yeah it was it was a fun sort of gig and we we're just playing like handle or whatever for the organist but i was like you know what i would do gigs like this all the time yeah uh what else what other gigs have you played i mean I, I did a lot of like I've done like chamber orchestra stuff but since coming back to town I think I've really only played um played I hear I see mm-hmm. and then just like my own like little things I'd love to play out more I'm just I hate like 90 percent of my recordings so I'm just <laughs> like nope no one gets to hear anything but oh, then yeah. how do you do that so. yeah at, at some point I just like got beyond caring what I sound like that's fair which is maybe bad because that just means I'm putting out stuff without any sort of critical <laughs> thought. But I also am more prolific now, I guess. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, I used to hate all recordings of my voice specifically, mm-hmm. but now I've done like 30 hours of radio and I just don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah, I have to maybe like rip off the Band-Aid. Yeah. But I've like only I've only recently gotten to the point where like the bassoon isn't like an expression of like my like mental processing so i'm thinking Mm -hmm. like it'll probably be like another year before i'm like this is okay to listen to Mm -hmm. um but i did tell um my buddy in kansas who i'm in foley sound with that i would try and get us a gig here so oh sweet yeah that's actually what i was trying to uh nudge you into oh yeah talking about foley sound (laughs) yeah so um my buddy jackson and i um we he was um at wichita when i was a percussionist um and we were just like we were both like into like weird music and we're like oh we should just do like a duo and we didn't have a name at the time um but uh dr mark foley who was hosting knob fest um kind of was just like this is uh jackson and gabby's like he just like made a noise (laughs) and so we called it foley sound which is like a double pun oh i see uh yes the name is the sound that he made yeah (laughs) yeah so but um but we were playing a little bit before we actually had a name um at like a noise festival but yeah it's been fun to play but since like we haven't played i guess since maybe 2017 or so but yeah it's it's cool stuff Mm -hmm. i think i've got a whole recording of your performance at knob fest that you gave me yeah it's like what is it like 30 Uh, 40 minutes 26 it looks like 26 okay you don't have to play the whole thing just like i think that maybe we'll play a little bit of that at the end of the show (laughs) fair enough yeah Yeah. (laughs) but we were doing a lot of things with the um what do you call them they're the essentially they're like these little like sound amplifiers that will amplify a surface. Mm -hmm. So you can turn like the table into a speaker. So what Jackson had done was got a huge bass drum and then used these sound, sound exciters and was running, um, was running like, uh, found sound and, you know, field recordings through the drum as a speaker. So you had like this different resonant space and then would, would also be playing on the drum while doing it. And then like, I would try and like mirror, the sounds that he was able to record either in some way and just kind of like have like this like nice like drone soundscape experience. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't listened to this specific recording, but I have listened to other stuff that you put out. I think you've got 
a couple videos i do guys, on yeah. the vimeo mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but then because like yeah in that same space we had done an, a performance of stockhausen's oben and unten yes i have seen that which was mm -hmm. pretty cool and um we were talking to the the guy who like hosted the series and it was somehow like the largest turnout they'd ever had so i think maybe it, it is less about you know i i think like having cross-disciplinary is usually i think what brings people to shows like this okay um because like i think like art kids are always going to be really into it and so like all of a sudden since it was at a gallery you had a bunch of art people doing it mm -hmm. and then like you know all of like the new music people showed up and then maybe they brought you know friends or something so all of a sudden you're like oh and then you had like you know the people who are not even in the school of music area but are like local you know people who are interested in like noise music and stuff like that and then they come so i think like if i think there just needs to be maybe more cross pollination mm -hmm. and then more like that uh show that um jean francois did with vulcan um that was like the chemistry right the yeah I, that I, was, I didn't make it to that but it I was amazing it was, cool. it was so cool mm -hmm. and it was the best turnout i'd ever seen for new music anything ever and i wonder if that is because it's so cross-disciplinary right it, so he I guess I don't really know all the details there. It was a uh, like music and science sort of combined. Thing. Yeah. yeah, I feel like Carlos would know more. Yeah, were you there? Yeah, I okay. was, and I took pictures on my old phone. So it was like a whole like theatrical sort of thing. There was like this huge like glass monster that was had like I don't want to say bioluminescent, but it was all the liquid in it was glowing in the dark. Mm -hmm. So like while things were happening, you could see it, and then like. Uh, Dr. Moore was like playing on it and then you had Vulcan playing mm -hmm. and then there was, it was just, it was super cool. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Moore is a percussionist and Vulcan that's, is a bassist, yeah. by the way. Yeah. I don't actually know what Dr. Moore's first name is. So that's um, Dan. Geez. Yeah, it's Dan. Okay. Yeah. And Vulcan is Professor Orhan. So like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah, I mean, it was awesome. I really enjoyed it. And like the, like all these chemistry department people were there, which was super cool. So. Right. Yeah. Maybe we should reach out to people more <laughs> yeah never gotta keep <laughs> you gotta keep things walled off yeah. yeah i don't know i i do like collaborative performance in general i think is a very cool thing yeah that is sort of something that we try to do with i hear i see <laughs> shows uh we get anything really anyone yeah. that approaches us really we consider yeah for performance no it's because awesome. why not we yeah. should try to learn from each other and like bring people together yeah I mean, I would love to have like a sort of like modular collective that like moves around and like does things and just like, hey, let's do, let's like, I don't know. I have this thing where I feel like there's this inclination where you feel like you have to move to a big city to make weird art happen. Mm -hmm. But I remember I met someone at IDRS last year who was part of, did that contemporary performance program um, at Manhattan School of Music. And he's like, I was like, well, you live in New York City. There must be like a bunch of new music things happening there. He's like, yeah, but how many people show up to a new music show in Kansas? And I was like, I don't know, like seven. He's like, oh, great. We have like 21. So I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. you, oh, never mind. Like, it's still the same sort mm -hmm. of problem, I guess, everywhere. So like, I think it's good to know that there's good art everywhere in the country, but also kind of good to know that like, oh, good art still has a hard time. Yeah, it's, it's good to know that none of us are <laughs> making any money out of it. Yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I, yes, we should, we should play more though. Let, 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 yeah, me, definitely. Yeah, let me know. Definitely. Uh, okay. So I think we're uh, winding down here. Yeah. Sorry. Do you have, do you have anything that you want to plug before um, we end the show? The drone drone. Um, of course. Of course. Is my, uh, have you made any progress on that? Uh, no, I, the one day I've, yeah. I've been, I've been eyeing Newegg. They have drone sales every so often. Yeah. So if anyone's interested in funding the drone drone, mm -hmm. do that. Um, I don't really have anything coming up soon um but fully sound would like to play a gig somewhere so mm -hmm. if anyone knows <laughs> anything yeah, yeah, about yeah. that but yeah no i think that's about it if you have anything else yeah i've know. got a list of stuff i need to get through oh okay. sure yeah i will sit and listen <laughs> okay cool so uh last week i had michelle guild on the show and we talked Yay. about our, our most recent project which is called the impede cast <laughs> which you can listen to on uh, soundcloud itunes and google play uh we're, i'm trying to get it on mixcloud which is like the lowest traffic website what is, and even, also is taking the longest to approve the rss feed i have no idea what mixcloud is uh it's it's sort of it's like soundcloud but okay. designed specifically for radio type things. oh neat so okay. it's all like hour-long recordings and right, stuff right. of radio shows it's it's really nice and easy to use but it no one knows about it oh, okay. as we just demonstrated <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Uh, yeah, but it's a show where we record conversations in hostile recording environments. That sounds amazing. It's It was really fun. The first episode was uh, at Adventureland, so we recorded on roller coasters and stuff. That's excellent. It's pretty fun, yeah. Uh, and for shows coming up, uh, Feed Me Weird Things, the next one is this Wednesday, June 20th at 9 p.m. at Trumpet Blossom. And you can hear music by Midwife, American Grandma, Kevin Greenspawn, and Kaleidoscope, friends of the show. Uh, and a little bit later in the month, Purchase oh, presents nice. Machine Daydream. This is Friday, June 29th, 10 p.m. at the Garden Club. Where is that? Because I keep seeing that name pop up. I have no idea where I it don't is. actually know either. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but I'm going to link the Facebook event in this episode yeah. description of this show so we can check out where the Garden Club is. All right. <laughs> And if you live in or near Cedar Rapids and you want to hear some concert band music, the Cedar Rapids Municipal Band is in the middle of their summer season. They have shows twice a week. I run the sound for them. So nice. you'll be able to hear everything very clearly because I'm very good at this. Hooray! <laughs> uh, the next one, if you're listening live, is tonight at Ellis Park, uh, assuming we don't get canceled Hot, due to the out. heat. Yeah. What, what, are you, what is the uh, rep for today? Uh, well... I'll give you a quick rundown. Oh. We have a, a solo performances by members of the band. So okay. we've got uh, a feature on clarinet, which is sort of a klezmer type of piece. Nice. Uh, that's performed by Christine Bellamy. Okay. Uh, we also have a trombone solo. My memory escapes me. Is it me. Blue Bells of Scotland? It is not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we also have a couple features with uh, steel drums. Which oh, is red. Cool. Yeah, okay. it's by Joe Perea. And there's also a prelude concert before that, Ooh. directed by him. It's the Cedar Rapids Jazz Ensemble. Nice. Yeah, I don't know what they're going to play. Okay. And then later this week on Thursday, the 21st, we'll be performing at the Barbecue Roundup at McGrath Amphitheater. Excellent. Yes, it'll be a good time. And next week on this radio show, we'll be back to the 4 p.m. time slot. This will be the 24th and... It will feature the band Boy Crazy. Nice. Which are my friends Stella and Addison. <laughs> they were on the big the Yeah, big, they were a part gathering. of episode twenty as well. Nice. So you've met them in the studio. Great. All right. And if you like the show that you heard today, uh, we have a website, I hear com, and at the bottom of that page you'll see links to all of our social media pages. We're on Facebook, Twitter. We have a YouTube page with videos of like hundreds of performances on our concert series. And the radio show gets recorded every week, and I release that online, which you can listen to on iTunes, Google Play, Mixcloud, and SoundCloud. Ah. <laughs> uh, and I, I include links to like tons of stuff in every episode description, nice. so there's a lot of stuff to explore there. Are you on uh, Stitcher? That uh, we are not on Stitcher. Okay. Do you listen to stuff on Stitcher? I do. That is the only app I have. Okay, then I will try to get this show oh. onto Stitcher. All right. You're the first person who's actually mentioned it to me, so I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I will put the effort in To then. be fair, I didn't know what podcasts were until fairly recently mm -hmm. i thought they were only for apple products and didn't just mean internet radio. well yeah because they use the word pod, pod in yeah it. yeah so it implies ipods yeah, yeah so no i i now that i know that pod is it's more of a general term yeah even though it doesn't sound like it yeah yeah so. <laughs> okay and you listening if you have music you'd like us to hear or you have shows coming up that you want us to know about or you want to play at an i hear i see show later in the year when we're doing concerts again or you just want to talk to us the best way to reach us is by email and you can find us at ihearic at gmail.com. All right, I've, I'm through my long list of plugs now. <laughs> and uh, I think we're going to close out the show with some music. Yeah, man. I have a recording of your duo, Foley Sound. You're performing at Knobfest in 2016, yeah. as previously mentioned. So I'll play a few minutes of that, and then we'll be gone forever. Hooray. Well, I'll yeah. be back next yeah, week. I'll be gone forever. You'll never know. You'll, yeah. I'm sure you'll be back yeah. sometime. All right, so here's Foley Sound. <laughs>
Seven K R U I. All right, I've been thinking. When life gives you lemons, don't make lemonade. Make life take the lemons back. Get mad! I don't want your damn lemons. What am I supposed to do with these? Demand to see life's manager. Make life rule the day and thought it could give Cave Johnson lemons. Do you know who I am? K R U I, Iowa City. 